Okay, guys, let's go ahead and turn to chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew. We are going to finish up this uh, chapter. We're going to look at verses 21 through 35. Remember, we've been in this chapter for, this is the third week. Uh, at the beginning of the chapter, we recognize that the context is set in verse 6 for the remainder of the chapter. It actually could be considered to be set earlier than verse 6, but it's definitely set in verse 6 where he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone. So these little ones, he's talking about believers. So the whole of chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew is how believers are to interact with other believers. Earlier on in verses 1 through 4, we saw how believers are to enter into the kingdom, I'm sorry, unbelievers are to enter into the kingdom of heaven like children, humble like children, completely dependent on their father. Verses 1 through 4. Verses 5 through 9, we saw that Christ's followers are childlike and are to be protected like children. In verses 10 through 14, we saw that Christ's followers are to be cared for like children. 15 through 20, we saw that Christ's followers are to be disciplined like children. That's what we looked at last week. Remember the process. You go one to one, then two or three to one, then the whole church to one, and then if they don't repent and turn, if your brother sins against you, you ask them to leave the congregation of the church, the fellowship of the church. So, so far we've seen Christ's followers are childlike, and are to be humble like children, protected like children, cared for like children, disciplined like children. And today we come to the last one, which is to be forgiven like children. I mean, think about how easy it is to forgive a child. Why? Why do you think it's so easy to forgive a child? Because your expectations. Your expectations on their level of maturity... It's a lot lower. It's easy to forgive a child. Jesus is saying in these verses that it needs to be as easy to forgive a fellow believer. But we are to forgive our fellow brother, sister, as easily as we forgive children. <laughs> we should get you a mask or something, Donna. So, in verses 21 and 22, so I have up here verses 21 through 35, forgiven like children, because that's what the last two look like. But I want to break verses 21 through 35 down a little bit more and look at verses 21 and 22, where we're going to see, we're going to see a call to unconditional forgiveness. Again, 21 and 22, we see a call to unconditional forgiveness. In verses 23 through 34, we see a parable about unforgiveness. And then verse 35, the whole point of it all, the reality of it, a warning against unforgiveness. Okay? So three sections, 21 and 22, a call to unconditional forgiveness. 23 through 34 is a parable about unforgiveness. And at the end, a warning about unforgiveness in verse 35. Let's read the entire text and then we'll go through these one at a time. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, here comes the parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But... When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. By the way, if you listen to the audio of uh, this text, like listen, listen to the Bible being read, the guy who's speaking this really gets into that, pay what you owe. 
That's why I, I did the same thing. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Verse 35, the warning. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Again, context is important. We're talking about believers. We're talking about brothers and sisters in the faith. Okay, We see the entire chapter 18 is talking about this context. Um, we see Peter then understands that. Because he says in verse 21, how often will my brother, brother being a title now is used as a believer, a fellow Christ follower. Um, we see throughout this entire chapter, they've been called, believers have been called little ones, children, sheep, and brothers. But Christ, or Peter, understanding this and says, my brother, talking about a fellow follower of Christ. Now, verse 21 starts off with the word then. It's an important word because when you talk about the flow of this teaching, we recognize that this question that came from Peter was rooted back to what happened in verses 20, 15 through 17. So look at the flow of the teaching. Look at 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Peter goes, okay, all right. So I get it. I get the process, Lord. Go one to one, then two or three to one, then a large group to one, and then you're two. Treat him as a tax collector and a, and a Gentile. But if he repents throughout that process, you're to forgive him. Right? So Peter's like, well, how many times am I to do that? How many times? Because it's a pretty long process, Lord. I mean, I don't know if I can do it a lot. How many times? During this time, the Jewish the Pharisees, scribes, they believe that you had to forgive three times after that. You're good. You don't have to forgive anymore. You can be bitter as you want to, and you're good. So the custom then is what they were teaching was three. So Peter's like, okay, well, let me throw out more than twice that number. Peter throws out what number? Seven. Now, there's a level here, too, where Peter could be thinking, because seven represents perfection, completion. Peter could be thinking, well, that's, seven's the perfect number. So that's perfect forgiveness. You see it? So that Peter's mindset then coming to Christ with this question that it's, uh, this is perfect forgiveness. Jesus says in verse 22, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Okay, ESV has 77 times. Some other translations have 70 times seven. So ESV has 77 times, so 77 number. And some other translations have 77, 70 times 7, which is 490. Either way, it's not the point. The numerical value here isn't the point. Okay? It's not a specific number. It's not a matter of calculation. It's a heart position. It's a heart that is willing to forgive ultimately. Not a specific number where you can cross off the list. Okay, I did this, 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 and now I'm done, so you're out of luck. It's, 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 honestly, it's an irrational thought to think that we are required just to forgive somebody a specific number of times. It's almost as irrational as somebody to say, okay, Lord, well, how many times am I to love my wife? See it? It's a pattern. It's a heart position. So these numbers, these numerical values are speaking more than just numbers. 
perfect forgiveness is a forgiveness that is unending because it's a heart. So we see then in verses 21 and 22 a call to unconditional forgiveness. I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, but a heart that is bent by and driven by unconditional forgiveness. Now let's look at this parable. Why does Christ use parables? Get ready. This is, this is, this is probably not an answer you're going to expect. His, he spoke in parables. His disciples came to him and said, Lord, why do you teach in parables? He actually says to his disciples, because to you it's been given to know the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it's not. So he deploys parables to communicate the truth to his followers and those who will be saved and disguise it to those who will not. To you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. To them it's not. Now a parable does have a main point to it. It has a, 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 teach, a, a point that Christ is communicating. That's what we need to sink our teeth into. What's the point of the parable? Okay, so as we go through this, we've got to be careful to let the point come to us and not start assigning words and meanings and titles to what's going on here. It's a parable to teach a point. What is the primary lesson Christ is conveying through this parable? Verses 23 and 27 first. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Okay, context. The kingdom of heaven may be compared. Okay, Christ in this parable, he's teaching truths. He's using this parable to teach truths that apply, that are truths of the kingdom of heaven context. Verse 24, he, we see the word 10,000, right? 10,000 what? Talents. This number, 10,000, is translated from the Greek word murios, M-U-R-I-A-S. And it can literally mean 10,000. But, because it is the largest numerical number, the number in, 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 in the Greek language, it is also used, this word myrios, to figuratively represent an uncountable, incalculable number. So a more accurate translation than the number 10,000 would be the word zillions. This word myrios could literally mean 10,000. Or the idea here is that it's an incalculable, vast number. So zillions of dollars. Therefore showing the reality that this servant cannot pay the debt. There's no way this servant can pay the debt. You guys get it? It's a very important component to this parable. So the debt is unpayable, incalculable. And so we see then a, a, a spiritual truth in here. That this myrios, 10,000 or zillions, could represent the unpayable, incalculable debt that we owe for our sin against God. We can't pay it. It is not possible for us to pay the debt that we owe for the sins that we've committed. The only way that that sin, that, the, that this incalculable debt can be forgiven is by God's grace through the cross, which He gives to us as a gift for forgiveness. It's a beautiful gift. But I do want to, I want to bring something out. Notice that the king wishes to settle accounts. Didn't have to. He would have been just as holy 
righteous and just. He would have been just as just. Do you guys feel that? Feel, you understand what I'm saying? He would have been just as just not to forgive the debt. Just like God would have been just as just and holy and righteous to condemn all who have fallen short of the glory of God. That all have sinned. So praise God that he's willing to settle accounts and has provided the way to do that via the cross of his son. Verse 28 and 30. How did the servant respond? He just got forgiven zillions. Free. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what, you, pay what you owe. Sorry, I have to do that. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So after reading this, one might be inclined to think, how could, this, how could he do this? Like, what's wrong with this dude? He was just forgiven zillions, and he's going to go and make a big stink about a, a couple of thousand dollars. And you would think, too, I mean, notice what he pleaded with the master back in 26. Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And notice what his fellow servant said in verse 29. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. The, the fellow servant had the same plea that the, the, the original servant had. I mean, don't you think that would have triggered a memory? Like, oh, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Maybe I should, oh, I just said that, and I was forgiven zillions. Maybe I should extend this not so much. Because the point of the parable is to teach about the sin of unforgiveness. Don't forget the point. What's the point of the, the greatest teacher, Christ, using a parable to teach the point? We want to make sure we understand the point. The point is unforgiveness. So he's using this illustration to uh, bring us to the realization that unforgiveness isn't okay, okay? So he's using this as the point to do that. And to help illustrate that even more, we see the response of this servant. He chokes him. I mean, Christ giving us the, the uh, 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 even deeper picture of the depravity of this servant's heart. To also give us a picture of the depravity of ours. Even after being saved, we still struggle with this sin. And that's the point that he's getting, because we're talking about believers. God's holiness, he was patient, he forgave. Man's depravity, impatient, doesn't forgive and starts choking the dude. So then what happened with the fellow servants? Look how this, how this parable ends. When his, in verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant? as I had mercy on you. And in, his, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Notice the master didn't expect the wicked servant to give the fellow servant a chance to pay the debt. But the master was expecting the servant to forgive the fellow servant his debt. Let me say that again. The master was ex not expecting the wicked servant to be patient and let this other one pay him the debt that he owes. The master expected the wicked servant to forgive the other servant, just like the master did with the servant. Much different. And so the master was provoked to wrath not because the wicked servant managed the king's money poorly. Think, look at this. Everybody look up. The master was not provoked to wrath because the servant 
managed the king's money poorly, the master was provoked to wrath because the servant didn't manage the king's mercy properly. He managed the king's mercy poorly. Mm. Because the point is that God has poured out His mercy on His children that are saved and forgiven through the blood of the cross. We are forgiven and have been given mercy. And so the idea is to let that mercy flow through us in forgiving our brothers and sisters. Not to be a poor steward of that mercy and, and hoard it. That's the point of the parable. To forgive like you've been forgiven through the cross. So this, so now we get into the warning now, and, and there's all kinds of questions. Is the wicked servant saved? Is the wicked servant not saved? Is he a believer? Is he an unbeliever? It's irrelevant. We don't even need to have that discussion. That discussion gets us away from the point of the parable. Doesn't matter. Because the point of the parable that Jesus uses here is to teach about the sin of unforgiveness. That you, brother, right? Because Peter says, this is in the context of believer, have been forgiven much and are called to be good stewards of the mercy that you've received. So he gives us the warning in verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So, that period at the end of verse 34, right? It says debt, pay all his debt, period. That's the end of the parable. Now Jesus brings us back to reality. Now we're outside of the parable. And now he applies the lesson of the parable to the disciples themselves by saying, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Before we talk about what Jesus is saying here, let's talk about what he's not saying. He's not saying... That God only saves those who are forgiving. You forgive, then I'll save you. That's not what he's saying here. Because that's works-based righteousness. That's earning your salvation. I've forgiven, so now you have to save me. No, 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 that's not what he's saying here. He is speaking of people forgiving each other after they've been experienced the free gift of grace through salvation. Amen? Because if he was saying, forgive and then I'll save you, that's a works-based salvation. Do this, do this, do this, and then you'll be saved. No, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is a gift. This is not of your own doing. Because if it was your own doing, if you could save yourself by being a good person, then everybody would be walking around heaven patting themselves on the back. Because I earned my way here. That's not how it's going to be. In heaven, it's going to be running up to Christ, patting him on the back, because what he accomplished on the cross gives us the gift of salvation. Big difference. Nobody will be praising you in heaven, including yourself. They will be praising Christ because He accomplished it. So what He is saying, He is saying that a forgiven heart forgives. It's that simple. A heart which understands its own wretchedness. A heart that recognizes how filthy I am when I stand before the Holy Creator of the universe as a sinner, completely opposed to His way. A heart that understands its own wretchedness. Understands the level of undeserved forgiveness it's received. And it's a heart that is humble and willing to also pass that forgiveness on. Now, I'm not... We're also to do that with unbelievers too, to forgive unbelievers. But the context of chapter 18, we're talking about within the fellowship. Okay? We are to, we, we are to have a heart of forgiveness, but this specific lesson is about forgiving a fellow believer. However, there are times during our sanctification process that we struggle with the sin of unforgiveness. It's not, it's not like once you come to Christ, 
you're like for, forgiven everybody with no problem. That's not the way it works. He's still working this unforgiveness and bitterness out of our heart as he continues to sanctify us. Some struggle more than others. And he says then, in those times when we fall into the sin of unforgiveness, we can be, we can expect to be disciplined. Because look at what happens in verse 35. I mean, that's not favorable circumstances. I'm sorry, verse 34. There's punishment here. There's, there's discipline here. He's thrown into jail. Now, we've got to be careful that we, we don't start assigning different things to, until he's able to pay his debt. I think the point is you're going to be punished. There's discipline. He, if, as, as a follower of Christ, habitually walking in the sin of unforgiveness, with that bitterness in your heart, unwilling to forgive a fellow brother or sister, expect to be disciplined. Expect to be punished. For what purpose? So that you repent. So that you repent, and turn from unforgiveness, turn to the cross, remember the forgiveness that you've received, and then go to your brother and forgive. Because it's a warning. As followers of Christ... We are not perfect. And the warning is, when you're in the sin of unforgiveness, you need to repent. If not, discipline will come. And we see this all over Scripture. The process of discipline which leads to repentance is exactly what Jesus tells the church in Revelation, uh, church in uh, Laodicea in Revelation 3.19. He says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So... Be zealous and repent. And we, we, we see, and, and even Psalm 119 that we, we're, we're studying on the side, which we'll pick up again next week. The psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. So he was going astray. God afflicted him. But now I keep your word. He obeys. I therefore, in, and in this context, repents of his sin of unforgiveness with his brother. So affliction, discipline, caused him, the psalmist, to repent. And in this case, the example would be uh, forgive a brother. So we've got to be careful that we aren't like this wicked servant. Warning, warning, warning. Don't be like this guy in the parable, which is a story to teach a point. Don't be like this. But instead, remember the mercy and forgiveness that you have been given. You have been forgiven a debt that you cannot pay. So let that mercy and forgiveness flow through you. It's the same principle that Paul reminds us in Ephesians 4.32. He says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. As God, here's the example, as God in Christ forgave you, therefore forgive one another. So, listen, if there's some folks in this room struggling with this um, sin of unforgiveness, repent. Repent, turn. Turn. That's the point of the parable. We are to be good stewards of God's mercy. Let's read this one last time. Verse 21. This is the end of this amazing teaching in chapter 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Not a number, but a heart position. Here comes the parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, zillions. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. 
But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we first praise you and thank you for the mercy and forgiveness that you have bestowed on us who owed zillions, couldn't even come close to paying the debt that we owe for the sins that we've committed against you. So we praise you for the, the mercy that you've given to us, the forgiveness that we can receive through the work of Jesus on the cross. He is the lamb that was slain, Lord. We praise you for that. And Lord, we repent. We repent of that bitterness of unforgiveness that we have in our heart, that we struggle with. Lord, we, we hear the warning. We, we turn from this sin of unforgiveness. And Lord, I pray that we go to our brother or sister who we have struggled with forgiveness and have a conversation about that. And Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit, you set us free. Thank you for this warning. Thank you for your patience with us as we see the Master's patience. Help us to be patient with those around us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.